Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Inside Jerry's Brain. You can see on the screen now that um, you can actually follow along or explore Jerry's Brain at uh, bra.in forward slash Jerry. So you can view Jerry's Brain online and take your own self-guided tour. Um, and also the GoToMeeting question panel is going to be open today. I'll do my best to answer all of those questions as they're coming in. Uh, thank you, John and Eric. A couple of questions trickling in already. Um, I'll do my best to answer all of those and present Harlan and Jerry uh, with a couple of questions that, uh, that we select out of that grouping towards the end of the demo today. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And so I'm going to pass things for now over to the creator of The Brain, Harlan Hugh. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining and uh, welcome. Um, so uh, today is a, a really exciting day. Um, I'm very happy to be talking to Jerry about his 25 years of using the rain, over 25 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, milestones in there that we'll, we'll get into, but um, I just want to start, talk a little bit about uh, kind of who Jerry is and how we met him. Um, so uh, Jerry is the famed tech tech analyst um, and perhaps one of the most connected people in the whole uh, kind of industry. Uh, that, that that's uh, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> he knows a lot of people. One and he knows a lot of stuff, and it's all in his brain. So um, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for uh, everything you've done with your brain so far. <laughs> um, thank you, Harlan. Thank you very much. And um, first, let me just congratulate you on like a quarter century of startup life, and uh, yes. having made it through like this this long. Because I I estimate that in the dozen years I was a tech analyst, I probably saw four thousand software pitches from different companies. And uh, most of them are not alive to tell about it now. Uh, most of them are probably in my brain, uh, which is interesting because when I was when when you first came through our offices, um, my job was to track the industry, and this was the perfect tool to track the industry. And we can we can demo that as well. But I just wanted to start by saying thank you, and by doing a little bit of history, I I, I have here in my hot little hands. Uh, the original packet from Natrificial, the name of the company then, and this is the letter confirming our first appointment in December of 97 uh, in our offices in New York. I used to write Esther's newsletter. Uh, I loved the product, wrote about it in our, in our newsletter. Here's another packet that came a little bit later, which includes uh, the reprint you guys did, authorized reprint. You called us up and said, can we do this? And we we're like, yeah, 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 of uh, the article that I wrote about the brain called Get a brain back when, and then uh, just for amusement, I will show you that uh, uh, oh, at, at, the, at the 20th anniversary, you sent me an autographed T-shirt um, <laughs> from the brain. So I figured I would put that on and drag that out as we were going. Just just to say, um, you're passing through the office and then opening your laptop, sitting to my left, I think, and my wet brain looking at you doing the demo, going, "Oh, I could do that." Like that was a really transformative moment in my life, and. Um, at this point, you know, somebody, those of you listening in, at some point you might have like played too much Tetris and seen like when you closed your eyes to try to sleep, you would see the little Tetris bricks coming down inside your eyelids. I sometimes see in conversation with people when I don't have my brain open, I'll see in my mind's eye where to put things in the brain and how to curate because I'm sort of fused with it in a cyborg-y kind of way. So, so awesome. uh, take it away any any direction you want to go, but I'm I'm really happy that, I'm really happy that we have the occasion to be here. That's so cool, Jerry. Um, yeah, no, that was a that was a momentous occasion for uh, for me also. Um, you know, we can we can get into all that uh, a little later, but um, yeah, I do remember coming to New York and coming to your office, and we we were you know full of anticipation when we were getting there. And uh, Don, my partner, and I were like kind of nervous and like, oh, what's this guy going to be like? And like, as soon as I opened my laptop and started sharing, I was like, oh, okay, this is going to work. I remember well. Don had a deck printed in front of him, paper, you know, stapled, and he thumbed it and he looked up and he said, I have a feeling we should skip the pitch for a second and just go straight to demo. And yeah. then you opened up your laptop and then we were in that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, it was kind of like, uh, it kind of felt like you had been waiting for it. <laughs> in, in, a, in a strange way, yes. And, and we can get into the, the whys and hows of that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Well, before we uh, kind of get too uh, far into the details of uh, history, um, I want to uh, get, give people a chance to kind of get to know your brain. Um, it's a, it's a, an artifact at this point, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we talk about the statistics, statistics all the time, but um, you know, as Matt said, it is uh, the largest human created brain in the world. That we know um, of. That we know of, yes, that's true. <laughs> Some people may not have, uh, have told us about their larger brains. Um, I know we have a few others that are over a couple hundred thousand thoughts, but um, I haven't heard about anyone in the 500,000 range. So, um, but uh, Jerry, uh, do you mind kind of just browsing around in your brain here so that uh, people can get a sense of kind of the stuff that's in there? I see you've got uh, chat GPT to. up there. Yeah, I'd love to. I'm a little bit of an unusual brain user in that um, I created this brain data set that I'm looking that I'm showing you right now back in as soon as they let me use the software, like January of 98, I guess. <clears throat> and um, I've been feeding that one file all this time. There are very few, maybe no other brain users who have one file. Most people create lots of brain files, either for commercial reasons or to separate their business life from their private life. I put everything in here. And then I don't use the notes field very much. So down here, you can type in notes. You can say anything you want. I don't use this for writing essays or doing notes. I'll put a link over to a Google Doc or whatever else. But I think of my brain file as a lightweight map on top of Wikipedia, websites, YouTube, everything else, linking it and sort of gluing it all together. And at one point at a conference years ago, somebody asked me to create a, a brain for them. So I started with the periodic table of elements. Uh, and um, and I started with you know the element hydrogen and kept on going from there. And like we finished the demo and I looked at it and I'm like, well, metals are connected to metallurgy or connected to this and that. Why would you want anything not connected into the whole universe? So I went back and just kept feeding the same brain. I'm here at a thought called ChatGPT. For those of you new to the brain, every node is called a thought. You can only connect thoughts to each other through these three little circles called gates. So I have things off to the left. This is a jump. These are jump thoughts. I have things above that are parent thoughts and things below that are child thoughts. And when I click on something else, so I'm going to click on milestone technology events, that rotates into the middle, becomes the active thought. And what was before uh, the active thought becomes a child because I clicked above. Uh, and then we, we progress on through. So here's my my list of milestone technology events, uh, when Deep Blue beats uh, uh, Gary Kasparov in 97. And that, the, this little W means there's a fave icon uh, and a URL attached to this thought. If I click on the fave icon, it should launch my browser to that page in Wikipedia. So here is the page for Deep Blue versus Gary Kasparov. So everywhere you see a fave icon over here, that means that I've connected a bookmark to it. So one way of looking at what I'm what I'm doing here is, it's a slightly obsessive way to manage my bookmarks. And if you've ever tried to manage your bookmarks in your browser, you know that that is just terrible software and there's no reason to, to use it because you get more than a couple hundred things in there and you're never gonna find anything again. And I can kind of find everything here. And then last thing, just by way of quick orientation, um, uh, ChatGPT is really hot right now. So I, I actually created a thought called We Are Now in the GPT World. And I put this in sort of uh, December last year when it dawned on me that this was a momentous thing happening in our world. And I've been creating, you know, amazeball stories about using ChatGPT and AI uh, and, and others, sorry. I've got uh, alternatives to ChatGPT uh, over here, for example. So you could look at Bard from Google or Claude or Genmo or uh, so apparently Alibaba just released one called Tong Yi Chang Wen, which I'm sure I mis mispronounced terribly, um, but there's a Chinese alternative now, uh, and trying to figure out how to do prompt engineering and all of that. Um, I'm also collecting, as I do very often, critiques of ChatGPT. So for example, can't explain its reasoning, these essays have no soul, it has math errors. And I'm like, you're using a saw to try to pull out a screw. Of course, it doesn't do math. It's not like like if you don't if you understand what this technology is, uh, it sort of matters. And it's uh, I'll add one more thing, which is um, 
ChatGPT is sort of a, the latest generation of neural network technology. And in my little box alongside uh, these uh, early packets, I also found some research that I wrote back in the day before this. Uh, so in 1988, I wrote a, uh, an industry report called Commercial Prospects for Neural Networks. Um, and this is like the latest incarnation of that same technology, which has now grown up and, and gone to market uh, in a really big way. So let me pause there and, and uh, take me where you'd like me to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 25 years ago, uh, neural networks were uh, such babies. It's, it's uh, you know, when you said it's, it's become a commercial product, I almost thought you were going to say like it's grown up and you know it's moved out on its own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, neural networks became uh, deep learning, became a bunch of other stuff, and now now we're sort of in the generative AI space. Yeah. Um, but but I remember like these early days and and trying to figure out what happened. Uh, there was a book called Perceptrons, uh, which basically killed off early neural network research. Uh, Minsky and Papert. Uh, wrote in 1969 a book that erroneously said neural networks will never work. Uh, they hmm. were correct about single layer networks, but they didn't understand. The reason we call it deep learning is that there's multi-layered neural networks and those are capable of insanely uh, complex things. And so uh, Perceptrons managed to, to basically stop research for a, more than a decade in the, down this branch and everybody went over to things like expert systems and fuzzy logic. Uh, which kind of tapped out after a while. So there's a lot to say, and and I'm doing this partly to show that all these milestones uh, are important to me, so I track them in the brain. Cool, cool. Okay, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about AI later, so um, I don't wanna get too far off track there, but I, I couldn't resist uh, talking about it a little bit. <laughs> so um, a few things I wanna mention. Um, you showed the packet there. We we do have a digital copy of that uh, release 1.0 uh, newsletter with the article on the brain. Um, I believe it's somewhere on our website. Um, and uh, so if, if anyone's interested in checking that out, uh, you can you can go and take a look. I believe. Um, and then also, uh, I'm sure you guys, anyone who's following along here, um, it's uh, there's so much in, so much interesting information in Jerry's brain. Um, you, you can go and look at it right now at uh, bra.in slash Jerry. Um, but also we are uh, kind of tracking everything that, that Jerry is clicking on um, and it's going to be available uh, for you to follow along with. So um, yeah, this is a feature that, that Jerry's actually been asking for for probably a good decade now. <laughs> I'm nothing if not persistent and patient. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, with the new web client, uh, it's much easier to do. Uh, we're going to have that working uh, for everyone to uh, to follow along um, afterwards. So um, yeah, so don't uh, you don't have to get too distracted by <clears throat> excuse me what's on what's on Jerry's screen. You can go check it out um, afterward. So all right. Um, so we kind of already talked about how we we first met. Um, I guess the question that I would want to know the answer to, and I think a lot of our audience would want to hear also, is when you first started using the brain, um, during that first, you know, two or three months or so, um, how, how was the experience and, and, and what were the, the, the kind of um, stumbling blocks that you might have come across um, just kind of getting, getting into it in that, in that very early incarnation? So it was funny. Um, I needed no coaching or training or manual. Like you demoed it. I kind of got it. And you let me have access, I think, a month before you did general availability. And I yeah. just started going. And part of the joy of using the brain for me was that it didn't force me or tell me where to put things. It wasn't checking for logical consistency or some kind of taxonomical rigor or any of that stuff. I, I, I used to describe it to people as Photoshop for ideas. It just mm -hmm. gave me some power tools to allow me to arrange things. And then, um, so I was in, uh, I was in the, the tech business, so I was tracking who competes with whom and who funds whom. I'll do a quick demo here, but this was my 
my job at the time was, and Andreessen Horowitz didn't exist then. They, they were launched in 2009. I, I actually met Mark Andreessen uh, when, he, when he and Jim Clark came and visited Esther and me to pitch their Mosaic browser. And uh, I think they had just started Netscape. I don't remember exactly what it was. But for example, I used the jump thoughts for funding. And so here's a company called Descript that was funded by Andreessen Horowitz, but also by Redpoint Ventures and Spark Capital. And this is never meant to be complete. There is no way I manually could actually make things complete. But rather, when I look at things, I notice a piece of news. And so I'll just kind of add a little piece. They, they also funded BuzzFeed. Uh, Lara Hippo Ventures uh, also founded BuzzFeed. They're under other venture capital firms, et cetera, et cetera. And then if I go back to Descript, for example, uh, they're under transcription services and apps. Here are all the transcription services and apps that I've heard of. And sometimes <clears throat> I'm not perfect in how do I categorize things. Here are translation services and apps. Uh, so here's Google Translate, for example, which is under uh, Google services, of which there are many. And then uh, here is a complaint thought called Google's habit of suddenly abandoning offers. They killed uh, Google SideWiki, uh, uh, Google Reader, Google Wave, Google Buzz, all dead. All in, all in the graveyard. But you can see how in my job at the time, this was like magic. And I, I've, I've, I was a huge hypercard user way back in the day. Mm. Uh, and for a while in my early tech days, hypercard was my, my address book, my calendar, uh, my Rolodex, and my to-do list, uh, and my note-taking app. And that worked okay for a while, and then it kind of tapped out. And then Apple, mm. of course, didn't realize what they had in hypercard. But I've kind of moved from thing to thing and I think one thing that's been really beneficial is, even though I try a whole lot of software all the time, I, I didn't stop using the brain for 25 plus years and it's paid off a lot. And I have a lot of friends, uh, Gene Bellinger and others, who have installed and uninstalled the brain multiple times during their careers. And then they've tried this and tried that. And, and the, the, the brain is not a panacea to all knowledge management problems, but it's really magical for reasons I'm happy to describe. And, and that's what worked for me when we met, when I started using the software. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, your, I guess your job kind of was um, very much suited to a, a network uh, organization, right? I mean, if you Absolutely. didn't have a, a network way of organizing things, you you almost couldn't find anything, right? Because who, com who competes with whom, who funded whom, who, which PR company represents whom, all of those questions were important questions to me. Right, right. So yeah, so you've, you've kind of developed um, uh, what we would call a knowledge model. Um, I think you call them uh, cliches or something. Uh, so yeah, uh, I call, cliche is <laughs> not, the, not, the best, uh, not the best word for it, but um, one of the things that, that happens when you start building a brain, curating a brain, is that you have to decide where to put things. And then I think if you're smart, you do that consistently. So for example, I always put authors above their books and actors under their movies. The example I use all the time is Brad Pitt. Uh, so here's Brad Pitt under the movies he's been in, next to Angelina Jolie. Uh, they're, they're connected through Brangelina, which is the name of a single name couples like Javanka and Tomcat and uh, Billery. Um, <laughs> but then... But then here's movies. So here's the movie Seven, shot in 1995. I put directors to the left always, because I, to me, the director is the creator of the movie. I don't usually do producers, etc. But Seven is based on the Seven Deadly Sins, and I've got them listed here. So here's avarice, gluttony, lust, pride. I think that's kind of fun, right? And yeah. and so so that path over and over again is what I ended up doing, and um, then it led me here, right. So for so for companies, you have um, the funders on the on the left, and the, the founders above, I imagine. Um, the no, founders board. below. So so um, here I don't have the actual founders listed, but I do have uh, a couple people in staff. Usually, okay. founders I put directly under the company, and then other staff I put under a the company name staff. And then as people leave, I will create a thought. I'll just create a thought here. Uh, so I'll, I'll create a thought called uh, company name alumni. I'll link that back to the company. And then this may amuse you. Uh, I have a thought called techie alumni and that's how quickly I can link to it. This is under alumni, which is larger, but these are all alumni of tech companies. So here's people who used to work at DocuSign. I guess I don't have a lot of them. Uh, Airbnb, Etsy alumni, 
Uh, here's Adam Freed, John Allspa. What's he doing now? I'm not sure, but I could look at his LinkedIn profile because I've linked it. I think he's with Adaptive Capacity Labs. He also worked at Friendster and Yahoo. His, this is his Twitter account, Allspa. And I just have to say that this little glance at a human in context is a really quick way of seeing what they're up to. And right at hand is his LinkedIn profile so I can see the full resume. If there were a Wikipedia page for Allspa, I would have I would have done that first. So here's Brian Acton. So I prefer to do Wikipedia pages and then I put LinkedIn below. But lather, rinse, repeat on this for long enough and it works. And so that's so one cliche is that. Another cliche you just saw me run through with startups which was funders and PR and legal firms to the left, products and principals and staff below, category and larger umbrella things above. Great, awesome. Yeah, I guess, um, well, yeah, when, when, when we came up with the idea for the brain and I started designing it, um, the, uh, you know, there was two kind of core ideas, I guess. One was like, um, we wanna replace the desktop and the whole concept of files and folders kind of being outmoded and um, you know very limiting in, in kind of the way that people think about how to organize their information. Um, so we wanted to be kind of able to maintain that hierarchy uh, through the parent-child relationship. Um, and then at the same time, we wanted to be able to have uh, kind of networked connections. So that's why there's the, the jump relationship, right? And, uh, and those three relationships, of course, kind of form the heart and the soul of the of the brain visualization. Um, but um, I'm curious as to, uh, I guess, kind of how how you were able to adopt to that um, and whether that was something that was uh, uh, a concept that you had to digest or was it just like, oh, okay, that's how it works? Um, uh... I, for me, it was like a duck dropping into a pond, and I was like, I, oh, got, I got this, you paddle around and it works. And the, the, the location of the three gates and using them effectively mm -hmm. felt like the right way to organize information for me. And then I would look at other visual, and I collect you know, other kinds of visual tools of all different kinds. And I don't know why nobody else does, does what you do, but the eye can't parse a big circle very easily. All the rubber bandy models aren't consistent, so that things are, you know, force force graphs are interesting. Force directed graphs are, are pretty interesting, and one of your alternative views is a force graph, but nothing ever lands in the same place, and you can't tell why something is left, right, up, down. Whereas with you, I always have a sense of orientation. I always I always know in the brain which way is up, so to speak, just metaphorically up. And right. for me, for me, that's huge because. That means that every screenful it has a, a property I call local structure, um, and so here's my brain has local, uh, a comfortable local structure, uh, and it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. But this notion of local structure is like how the web works. If I'm on your personal website and I click a link that goes to someone else's uh, personal website, my brain has to adapt to the new site and mm -hmm. and let go of how you designed your website and your orientation and hopefully it was you know it had some a little bit of rigor to it, and then my brain goes oh, there's a nav bar over here here's what's present on this website and that local structure will make sense as well, and for me screen after screen or thought you know, act, different active thoughts have local structure in part because I invented these cliches that I use consistently, but in part because just the way the brain works, there's always an up. And I never, I don't ever look at the whole ball of twine. I have more than a half million things in here, but I'm never looking at more than a very crowded screen full of brain data. I'm curious about what the big ball looks like, and I'd be very interested if somebody programmatically wanted to use that to analyze things, that would be cool but it's not on my wish list. I don't think I've ever asked for that from you, right? right. That's, no. and, and to me, that's kind of interesting. Like this level of Zoom, um, and, and so Zoom levels is one of the design issues for how you get in and out of information landscapes that I think really mm -hmm. matters, right? And, and the brain has like a sweet spot Zoom level for me where I'm not just seeing one piece of, one document and then have to follow links to other documents, but if I don't, follow the links, I don't know what the other documents are. That's what happens on a wiki or in other places or in other note-taking tools. And I'm also not so far zoomed out that I'm looking at the ball of twine where really those ball of twine diagrams like at visualcomplexity.com are sexy and mostly yeah. worthless. Yeah. Mostly worthless. Like 
like my friend Valdis Krebs knows how to use them to analyze sentiment or like what books are conservatives and, and liberals reading that are different and how does that map? That's really useful. But in general, you kind of want to be close to the work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I guess it's a good and a bad thing in a way. Like um, the the main the main diagram or the main way that the brain is laid out is like essentially unchanged. <laughs> um, it is. So I haven't changed the blue background. I, I have yeah. not. I found everything else was less readable. And for me, readability is, is key. I don't use a lot of colors. I don't use advanced features you added later, later like labels and tags. And I, I don't use any of those. Um, right. Also, and types, I don't use thought or link types. And it's not that I hate metadata. It's that I made a really, I made two early decisions, one of which was probably wise, the other one of which probably not so wise. The wise one was to, to optimize for speed of entry. So I don't add metadata because that means that now to add a book, I would have to add author of, written by, a whole bunch of metadata that I don't have time to do. I, I, I wanna be really, really quick and efficient. If there was some AI sitting by my side that said, oh, Jerry, it looks like you've added a book. Can I mark that up with metadata? Mm -hmm. I adore metadata and that would be fabulous, but I don't do that. And then the right. other thing I decided was to, to turn off all the features and all the use cases that might make my brain file blow up really fast. So I turned off the indexing of websites that I add to the brain. I don't do that. I, turn, I, 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 turned off, I don't use the notes field very much because I knew that I was going to write a whole bunch of documents. And I'd rather have a link to the document, but not the full text of the document inside the brain. That might have been a, a, a tactical error. Um, because now I sort of wish that I had more content in the brain as I look at what to do with my brain data file and anybody listening, I'm really interested in what would you do if you had this data set uh, moving forward. Cool. Tell, tell me about the colors because um, that's a, a relatively recent addition to your brain, right? Yeah, I think it's only a couple of years old. Uh, white is the default color for thoughts, so I leave almost everything white. I then um, I then mark yellow things that are uh, me are meant to attract the eye, and that means come over here and take a look. There's no you'll notice there's no URL connected to this thought, but these are design issues for an open global mind platform. Like like what would an all singing all dancing system look like? And then I use purple this purple um, for opinions. So uh, so uh, here's a sort of a, this is more of a question than an opinion, so it could have been yellow. The, the boundary between yellow and purple isn't always sharp, but you know, is AI going, more of a threat or a benefit? That's a really interesting question. Is, is AGI an existential risk? AGI is artificial general intelligence, the idea that you know, these, are, these smart systems are, are going to be as smart as humans, for example. So I just use those three colors, there might be, a couple instances where I've used a different color for some notable reason, but that's it. That's my three color thing. And uh, the vast majority are white, a chunk are yellow, and a very few are, are sort of these, uh, these purple uh, colored thoughts. Cool. Okay. Well, I wanted to uh, make sure I asked you that because I'm sure a lot of people are looking at your brain thinking, how does he, why does he choose these different colors? Um, so um, backing up for a second, now that you're at over a half a million thoughts in 25 years. That's uh, uh, 20,000 thoughts a year. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 55 a day is the math. 55 thoughts a day. But that so, includes week that includes weekends. And, and th by comparison, I asked two questions. Do you see 50 interesting things every day in the in the too much information torrent that's going past us? The answer is mostly yeah. Right, and if you had a healthy bookmark capacity in your browser, you would probably be bookmarking maybe 50 things a day. And I'm adding a little bit of work to that, a little, mm -hmm. bit, and, and by a little bit of work, I mean I've got a little routine that I go through when I add things to my brain that throws my brain into system two thinking, which is from Danny Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Happy to go into that more if you want. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm curious for you to kind of go over your. Uh, methodology in terms of like how you decide what to add to your brain um, and what to connect it to. I mean, those those two are kind of like key questions, especially since you're adding so many things and you've managed to scale it for so long and, you, and you've never um, spent a whole lot of time kind of reworking things or re-gardening things or... Exactly. Um, so let me just use uh, this page. Um, and I'll just talk through it real quick. So 50 or 60 times a day, about 55 times a day, it turns out on average. Um, I think 
is this worth remembering to something that's floating by an email, on a mailing list, on a, in the news, uh, on Twitter, wherever, any place. I really want permalinks. I need permalinks and I hate sites that don't give me nice, persistent, consistent um, permalinks. Mm. So first, is it worth remembering? Yes, great. Where do I where do I put it? Because I don't like orphan thoughts. I don't I don't like anything detached from everything in the brain. And it's and because I'm curious about everything and I've been using it for a long time, there's almost always a place to put it. That's a very easy question to answer. So then I bring up that thought. Then I drag the URL into the brain. Still dragging the URL is the fastest way to do this. It would be really nice if there was a system keyboard shortcut that did that. But then um, did the brain properly pick up the name in the URL? Do I need to clean those up? What should I call this thought? What else should I connect it to? What else can I learn about it? Because I'm curious about everything. And then I go on to the next one. Okay. Um, and this, this means that my unaided recall is better. I'm always thrown into system two thinking, which makes my recall better, but which makes me think a little bit deeper about everything I'm putting in. As I said, I always have this sense of orientation, but I also have this sense that I'm improving the the long-term context of the whole thing. I always, maybe this is a problem, but when I when I add something new to the brain, when I curate something and I put it in, I get the satisfaction you would get if you'd been looking for a piece of a puzzle that you couldn't find for a couple hours, finally located it and clicked it in place. So there's like a little oxytocin or dopamine mm -hmm. release in your, in your brain, and that's mm -hmm. kind of addictive, and I, I love that. And then also, um, I don't just put facts in my brain. It's not just Brad Pitt and his movies, but my opinions are in here. You could easily derive my beliefs about the world. In fact, I have a thought on the pin board called my beliefs. And then last thing is that the knowledge that I'm accruing here accumulates and then amplifies. And I, I, I don't want to scare anybody off because uh, the brain is useful when you put a couple hundred things in it, uh, but it just gets better. Cool. Um, so talk a little bit more about uh, system two. Um, I'm sure people are curious what that what that means. So it comes from this book by Danny Kahneman, uh, which is totally worth a read. He is a behavioral economist. He and Amos Tversky partnered up to sort of kind of found the field of behavioral economics, uh, which I've got here, and here's a Wikipedia page to it. Uh, and then uh, in Thinking Fast and Slow, he says, hey, we have this system one thinking, he calls it, which is our instinctual automatic knee-jerk response. So uh, if I ask you a quiz or a riddle or whatever, uh, you know, and I don't know one off, offhand, you know, how many nickels does it take to whatever, you'll have, a, you'll have an estimate. <clears throat> and your estimate is often wrong. Mm. And But we jump to conclusions a lot. So here's jumping to conclusions. Uh, we jump to conclusions a lot, we don't mind. But when you slow down and engage the gears and start using logic and thinking about this, uh, about whatever the question might be, all of a sudden um, you learn more, you figure things out, you can actually give a correct answer instead of like a, an off the cuff answer. So that, mm -hmm. That's mostly it. Okay. And, and, and in fact, um, in a call yesterday with a group of people talking about generative AI and all this, we pose the question, is this the beginning of system three thinking? Because, mm. because we were thinking about what it's like to think with chat GPT. And, and once you learn prompt engineering and get into that conversation, there's something else going on. And with my buddy, Pete Kaminsky, who, who was in this conversation yesterday, a couple months ago when this was warming up, I said, Pete, are you having boundary issues? Because I have externalized my mind into this brain thing, and there's something called the extended mind hypothesis, mm. uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so here, extended mind thesis, sorry. Um, I've externalized my brain into an extended mind in using the tool that you created, which is pretty interesting. And I can control it, I know where its boundaries are. <clears throat> but I'm really interested in a shared mind with everybody else, and I'm interested in melding my mind with this cyber mind with augmented intelligence, mm -hmm. then, then I need to still figure out where do my boundaries end and where are the rest of us and what does that mean? And I find that to be a really good question for the next decade or so. Uh, indeed, yeah. <laughs> so here's the brain as an extended uh, self or mind, for example. So connecting up to EMT and the extended mind book, which Annie, uh, Annie Murphy Paul just wrote. <clears throat> also a worthwhile read, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, I noticed um, when you when you did that search, um, you uh, you're quite adept at using kind of the prefixes of the words to narrow down right into where you want to get to. Um, in that case, you didn't actually know the the full name of the 
thing you were trying to get to, but you did manage to find it regardless. So when I used HyperCard, I created a little system of shortcuts that were unique strings because HyperCard was really good at search through a deck, through a card deck, mm. a card stack, I guess. <clears throat> and so if I had a contact who was an expert in neural nets, I would write N nets, N N E T S, on his or her record, and then I could just search for N nets, and I go next, 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 and I could find all of the people in neural networks in HyperCard. I carried that behavior over here in the sense of you have a really lovely type down buffer that'll tell me any thought and also notes that contain a string. So my brain is like, okay, what is the unique string that'll get me closest and quickest to the thought I'm looking for? And sometimes I can't remember the thought, but I can remember a neighboring thought, a competing product, a category name, anything. And, and if I get close, if I'm in the neighborhood, because I can see the neighborhood immediately, I can find my way to the thing. And there's yeah. very few tools that do that. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, seeing the, we seeing the about that. Yeah, seeing the neighborhood while doing the work is really crucial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that the um, the power of the connections that you build inside your brain, um, you know, it gives you context and it helps you understand things. But also, it's just like an amazing way to find stuff, right? Yep. Um, because you 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 remember who the person was that introduced you to it, or you remember somebody else that knew about it, or uh, as you said, a competing product, all those things. Um, you know, that's that's something that we've we've uh, kind of been beating the drum on, but it's 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 quite amazing to watch you do it because you have so many things in there, um, and you're so good at it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but I've kind of internalized how to do it the way somebody who learned. Uh, Photoshop or, or you know, n name a more difficult piece of software, but I never learned Photoshop because that and Illustrator, Adobe's menu structure was just too opaque and it took too long to train up on that. But for people who understand these things, it's like an extension of their fingertips. It's very much a cyborg-like capacity they have. And mm -hmm. th there may be probably more people who are on the call who are really adept uh, spreadsheet or PowerPoint or Keynote users. When you're so good at it that flipping around and making changes and all that is just, you're not thinking about the tool anymore, but it's internalized, that's a little magical place where the tool is in fact a much stronger extension of yourself. And that's kind of where I am with the software you wrote. And, and it's awesome. And, and I, I, I think I, I sort of have a bunch of shortcuts that I do in order to do that. Um, everybody might have noticed that I always have my browser visible for an inch on the left. And when I'm in the browser, my brain is visible for an inch on the right. The only reason for that is that the fastest way for me to add a thought is to grab the URL and drag it into the brain. That's mm. the only reason I've got my brain set up like that for, oh, I don't know how many years now. <laughs> That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. I was just reminded as you were talking there that uh, uh, one of the major changes that you made in your brain is was shifting from, from Windows to the Mac. Um, <laughs> it's funny, kind of the development of your your uh, brain and your kind of technology migration uh, has, has in a way driven the development of the software. Um, when, we, uh, <laughs> when we first gave you the brain, uh, yeah. I, th I think there was a CD in that package. <laughs> Could have been, I think, I think that's I think true. Uh, yeah. And I remember the day. I remember the day a while later. I don't remember when it was, but at some point I couldn't enter any more thoughts in my brain. Um, and I, I'm like, I wrote support. I wrote you. And I'm like, help! I can't add anything. And then I, I looked at how many thoughts were in my brain. I did this. I ran the statistics. I'm like, I know this number. And it was 32,767. I'm like, oh, I bet I've exhausted the namespace. <laughs> and it was like, yep, you did that. Yeah, yeah. So the first, <laughs> the first version of the brain used 16-bit um, uh, uh, integers for IDs, um, and they were signed integers. So it was, uh, it, it tapped out at 32,767. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we, we either knew you were coming up on that boundary, or we, or we, as soon as we found out you, you were there, um, we doubled it by turning them unsigned, which was like a relatively painless switch. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Switch. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we had one extra bit there that we just like, okay, we got it, right? And we didn't have to change very much. Um, you know, it's, it took up the same amount of space on the disk, all that stuff. Um, and back in the day, of course, we weren't able to use uh, external database software. We had to write our own database to make the whole thing work. And um, yeah, it would have been extremely painful for us if we had to 
find another way to, to extend it. So, but yeah, as soon as you did that, I realized, oh my goodness, he's only been at it for, I don't know how many years it was, like maybe two long. years, something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and you were already at that limit. I thought, oh, okay. So now we have two more years, if we're lucky. Exactly. <laughs> to rebuild to rethink, the whole back thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it took us, um, yeah, so just to put that in perspective a little bit, it took us uh, 95 to 98, it took us three years to make the first version of the software. So we started in 95, released at the end of 90, 97, so 98 really, mm -hmm. um, and then to move from uh, the uh, our own database to, to something else that was going to scale larger, um, we wound up rewriting everything uh, from C++ to Java. Um, and that enabled us to go uh, into the millions of thoughts, right? Um, and it also enabled the uh, switch to the Mac. <laughs> right, right. Multi-platform support and all of that. Multi-platform support, Which indeed. Which reminds me, um, uh, oops. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago uh, you wanted the brain to be OS. I remember there was a moment when legacy free Linux laptops were happening. And I have here a thought from August of 2007 that Lenovo shipped a laptop that had no Microsoft on it. And there was this, Microsoft was found guilty of, of antitrust because they were charging mm -hmm. all the, all hardware vendors attacks, whether or not you shipped it with Windows on. You had, to, you had to pay the Windows license, which was really a, a, a crappy practice, but they, but they were found guilty of it. Um, but Lenovo started bravely shipping uh, you know, Linux-only laptops, and I really was hoping that you would actually say, hey, the brain is better than KDE and GNOME for those of you <laughs> suffering under Linux, trying to make a, you know, a desktop that actually works really well, and actually like make the make the replacement, make the jump over, because you can yeah. connect any any local file to a thought in your brain as well as links to the outside world. Now, I don't use it that way very much, but it would have been a friendly way to do that. Just yeah, no, that was the that was the dream when we uh, when we first started was like, oh, we, you know, we want to we want to literally replace the desktop so there would yep. be no desktop um, and you could have your computer kind of like at the base have this network connectivity. Right. Um, you know, it'd still be great to do, but uh, things have shifted a little bit. <laughs> you know, there's still time. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Um, speaking of Linux, uh, the new version of the web client is out and uh well mostly out uh still uh not on the main website but it will be soon um yeah so we now have linux working again uh for anyone awesome. who's curious about linux <laughs> that's, great. that's great so um one of the other things i wanted to ask you about was um making your brain public uh of course when you when you first started using the brain it was it was only on your desktop there was no there was no cloud um, and uh, that whole concept uh, kind of didn't exist yet. But um, at some point, you decided, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna make my brain available to anyone." Um, what What was your your thought process behind that, and and um, and what are kind of some of the, the the things that have happened as a result? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't remember when you started doing the server, the web, you know, brain servers, uh, web brain, et, et cetera. But I was like, "Ooh, that's really interesting." And uh, at first, I was using it kind of as a backup just to, 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 to sort of synchronize. And I remember one day I had a, a pretty critical failure with my brain data file, and we just backed it up from the servers. And I was like, that's good. I like that. Um, and then it dawned on me that when I'm adding things to the brain, I have two audiences in mind. One of them is just me. And I'm, mm -hmm. trying, to, I'm trying to build things that are useful to me later. But the other audience is, I'm there's... Let me backtrack a little bit. Um, Tiago Forte of Building a Second Brain um, uh, was my guest for a podcast recently. Um, and during our podcast, he basically said, uh, you know, Jerry, my second brain is my private uh, brain using his system and his software. My third brain is my public brain, the things I publish out to other people. And I was kind of blown away, but then I realized that my default setting. So in the brain, I can make things private by clicking this little lock icon, and then this thought will be visible only to me, anyone logged in as me. Great. I do not use that often at all. And if I were using it, you'd see little lock icons under the thoughts, which you don't see here. I don't see any in, in view. Um, my default setting is everything is public, and I'm extremely comfortable with that. 
when I do a corporate presentation that nobody should know I was at that corporation, I will create a thought for that event, mark it private. And then as little as possible of what's connected to it will I keep private. Meaning if I met staff members of that company, I will add them to the brain and connect them up to company name staff. And nobody knows, the brain is not gonna divulge that, that I know them and that I met them at this event, but I will be able to come back and see that. And that's really useful for me. So my default setting is public, public, public. I wish more people knew about the brain and used it. I would do anything to make it more accessible and more useful to others. And more ambitiously, I'm hoping that my brain data becomes like a, an inoculation of mycelium into what I call the global brain, which I playfully call the big fungus. Uh, because I've been, I've been looking for some metaphoric ways of describing what does the space of shared ideas look like when people who prefer different tools can show up and share what they know into that central space because hmm. the brain the, hmm. there's different kinds of ways people's heads work right um, my, my wife april has a calendric memory she she says it's like her date book is open in front of her in her mind i don't know hmm. what i did last week without consulting my calendar some people like roam research and list oriented things right with backlinks cool why can't we collaborate in the middle and that's really where where I'm, what I'm aiming for professionally right now is like, how do I help us build a shared collective memory so that we can start to collaborate to fix problems that are about to like drown us? Okay. Well, the uh, the fight against uh, Cyberdyne systems is about to begin. So that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking of AI again, uh, we keep coming back to it, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, you once told me um, that something to the effect of, uh, I don't want AI to build my brain because I want it to be me and my thoughts, right? Um, have, have your views shifted on that or am I misstating your original uh, thought there? No, your, your thought is good. Um, and in fact, uh, I have a thought called lessons from my brain and uh, somewhere in here is I don't really want <clears throat> AI to add things to my brain. There we go. I don't want AI making all the connections for me, so I've, I've made this explicit in the brain. But I need to sort of elaborate on this now because I did say, gosh, it would be awfully cool if AI were sitting by my shoulder and said, hey, Jerry, can I help you curate this? Because everything I'm doing, I do completely manually now, and I've gotten pretty quick at it. Every now and then you guys uh, update the, the UI, and then I lose something that I could do quickly before that now is harder to do, which is like too bad. Um, but, but now I'm entering that space of where do I end, where does the AI start? And I recognize that the power of melding with the AI is extraordinary. And what I need to figure out is where is that boundary? So in a shared multi-person brain system, for example, I would need to feel comfortable, a big imaginary red emergency button so that when it got overwhelming for me, like I don't know where I am anymore, I could hit the button and go back to just what I put in to this shared web of meaning, just what I put in, because I know what I put in, I know because it passed through my eyes, it passed through my brain, I've, I've processed it, right? And part of the reason I'm so quick at using the brain is that I've never used the crawl features. Like right when you launched, you, were, you could crawl a website, you could crawl your directory, and you would create thoughts for every page in a, web, in a, in a, in a website, for example, handily, it was, it was easy. I've never used that because I don't want things going into the namespace that I don't know are there, right? Yeah. And to me, I, 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 I'm very, I, I, I'm curating kind of this namespace that matters a lot to me. So I care, I'm a little persnickety about punctuation and, and typing. It just, I, I don't like typos because then you don't find the thing, all of that. Right. Yeah, um, I'm sure people are, uh... <laughs> I'm sure everyone's wondering what the brain is going to do with AI. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, we, it is we, called the brain. Uh, I'm sorry? It is called the brain after all. It is called the brain, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, we've got some really cool stuff uh, that's, um, you know, ground ground shaking, like more than ground, well, I guess it's, Beyond beyond groundbreaking, whatever's beyond groundbreaking, <laughs> that uh, that we'll be ready to to show people in the very near future. Uh, we gave you a little preview of it a few days ago, um, and uh, yeah, well, I mean, kind of one of the things. Well, I mean, the brain's going to create thoughts for you via AI, 
um, among other things. Um, and one of the one of the thoughts that we had is that um, when when we when things are created by the AI, they should be uh, they should have some metadata on them so that you can you can know, hey, this was not input by me. This was this was an assistant that that did this for me, right? Um, great. Yeah, and you could you know turn them on and off. Um, you could see them visually distinctly and and all that stuff, right? But the uh, this whole this whole idea of becoming a cyborg and and um, kind of blurring the line between what's you and what's the machine, um, you know, you'll be able to to use that input not as like the final result, but as a suggestion, right? Uh, a building point. And when you go into the the thoughts that are generated, you'll be able to say, okay, well, I kind of like this, but I want to change like this, or I want to have more in this area, and you know, maybe I'm going to weed out some of these things, right? Um, and uh, the AI is going to be similar to kind of working with another person, right? Um, and yeah, for those of you that are using uh, the TeamBrain software, uh, you're aware that uh, we've we've been kind of working at this problem for some time. Um, and the, uh, the, the new uh, web client uh, that I've mentioned a couple of times now uh, is really uh, kind of enabling a lot of uh, innovation in this in this field because um, you know we can we can do things in real time and uh, and have the line between your brain and your teammates brain and the AI brain be uh, much fuzzier than it was in the past so uh, very very exciting things coming coming up here and what what you showed me I really liked it's re it's really powerful and I think there's this idea of your, your it's it's sort of like you're you're talking with an assistant or something while crafting this map, mm -hmm. right? Which is different. And and uh, prompt engineering or prompt craft is is like the new skill. And uh, I've had five instances in the last couple of days to recommend to somebody, you know what? Go learn how to do this. Those people are getting paid a lot of money. The prompt the prompt engineers. That is <laughs> like it may only last a year, but you can probably command a good salary over there. <laughs> but, but that's to create narrative. Right, and there's a lot of textual output, and this is unique in the sense of the output is a map that contains texts, but in 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 relationship in these different ways, and that's super powerful. And I'm very interested in how that evolves. I think that there's a there's a lot of juice here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so one one last question on AI, and then we'll see kind of what we have from the audience here. Um, one of the controversies with AI, um, particularly in the art world is that uh, the training materials have been kind of pulled from uh, a lot of different people and you know some people that may not have wanted their stuff to be pulled into AI. Um, how, would, how would you feel about kind of donating your brain or, or using your brain as a source uh, for, for training an AI? Um, so the question you just said, uh, basically, uh, GPT's effects on domains and industries. Um, well, I'm not finding this as quickly as I wanted to. So, oh, here we go. I, it was colored yellow and I wasn't looking at it. So, stable diffusion and chat GPT are theft of intellectual property. We didn't ask for our stuff to be scanned, and I, I totally understand yeah. that. And I can empathize with it. And it's, it's going to be an issue that we need to sort out, and I'm not sure that that horse can be put back in the barn. Mm -hmm. I have no such desire feeling or fear like as, as I said my default setting is public I want people to use what I've created what I've what I've curated in whatever ways are powerful for them I'm really interested in that happening and I'm eager to meet other people who have used any tool as extensively as I've used your yours um, to map out their belief systems and the evidence for their belief systems and how that all kind of fits together into their picture of the world if somebody made them king, what would their platform be? What would they go cause to have happen? I want to get way deep into that conversation. So um, I think we talked a couple of years ago about the possibility, and we haven't done this, of me super distributing my brain data file so that anybody starting with the brain could elect to, hey, I want to start with Jerry's data and then fork it. Um, I'm afraid of those forks. Um, because all of a sudden there's me replicated everywhere and it's like Agent Smith and, and there's like a million of you. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but yeah. I'm excited by the thought and I really like it. And 
my politics and my belief systems are pretty strong in a very particular orientation and may not be to some people's liking. But my hope is that my desire and possible ability to express those things in a tool like this is useful to other people who might then want to say, no, 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 this is wrong. I would say this instead. That conversation is important, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm all in favor of super distributing or hybridizing or uh, cloning or whatever. Uh, I'd love to do that. Very good. Very good. Well, yeah, I think we'll have some uh, some interesting outcomes from that uh, that perspective uh, in the next little while here. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, great. Yeah, uh, if I could uh, jump in at, at this point. First off, uh, mm -hmm. let me just say so many hellos and great to see yous and and uh, um, you know checking in. For, with both uh, Harlan and Jerry. I can't go through everyone's name, so I wanna let everyone know, I'll be sharing the full list of questions and attendees with Jerry and with Harlan. They can review this and, and maybe choose to, to get back to you. And I haven't um, been able to see those during the call or I would be in there chatting with you, but. Right, right. <laughs> Um, and so, and obviously there's a lot of questions that I'm, I don't live in Jerry's brain, so I can't answer those questions for you. I'm going to get to some of them now. And some of them, you know, the conversation has already answered these, uh, these types of questions. You know, the, what's the difference between yellow and purple thoughts and how much time do you spend gardening, uh, mm -hmm. versus actually adding an interesting question that, uh, that did come, come up. And it's not a competition, but we know that Jerry's brain is over half a million thoughts. Harlan, how big is your brain? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't look at the stats very often, um, <laughs> but I think I'm probably at about fifty thousand thoughts or so. And do you have, do you have like one main brain and then others that you spawn and do for different reasons, or how do you organize like? Number? I primarily have just one brain. Yeah. Wow, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I mean, I do have other brains that I use, quite a few other brains that I use for the purposes of, of sharing with the team and so forth. Um, so I guess probably my second most used brain maybe is the brain engineering brain, which is like um, the engineering team. You know, we have the documentation about uh, problems, troubleshooting, build processes, um, you know, new features, planning, kind of all that stuff is in there. <clears throat> Um, but that's, I mean, that's one example of, of the, the type of secondary brain that I would have. But uh, I am a advocate of the kind of one brain to rule them all uh, approach. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And I've just turned my brain to people I've met through my brain. Some of the people on the call might actually find themselves on this list. Oh, wow. every, every now and then somebody will ping me on LinkedIn or wherever and say, hey, I'm a brain user too, and I'll add them. Yeah. Oh, I should. <laughs> one one other kind of interesting historical tidbit. Um, uh, as Jerry was going through his brain, it reminded me. First of all, uh, the original version of the brain, you could not create a brain. You just started it, and that was your brain. <laughs> There's only one brain, right? Right. Um, so that is the uh, the one true way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, you mentioned that uh, you know you didn't like to have orphan thoughts, right? Uh, in the early versions of the brain, you couldn't have an orphan thought. Um, if you if you disconnected something from the uh, the network, it was like, okay, we're forgetting this. <laughs> yep, I remember that. Yeah. Um, another question that uh, <laughs> that came up was, <clears throat> um, and this is sort of along the lines of, you know, you you spend a lot of time adding, not gardening and cultivating, which means. You, I'm assuming you know where the thought is going to go when you add it. You don't have a, a collection thought where you you drop it into the brain and then categorize it later, or do you? So you all, you guys also added the brain box feature at some point, which I tried using for a while. It turns out I never go to the brain box, and I've, I I thought I would need a thought in my brain called file this somewhere soon, and I would just be adding a bunch of stuff there. I do not do that. I always add things directly where they're going to go. I don't have uh, uh, basically a queue of, uh, you know, go here when you've got spare time. Um, and I don't know what the effects of that are. And I don't, if, if somebody were to do that, it would probably work out fine as well. Yeah. I, I do have yeah. a, a place like that. I call it the scratch pad. Um, but I, t I tend not to put 
thoughts there. I put notes there. And then I extract those notes into thoughts later and connect them up, right? Yeah. But yeah, like, just like you, like every time I put a thought in, I feel like I always know what it's connected to before I start. <laughs> it's very, it's very interesting. It's like the software makes more explicit and more palpable the fuzzy connections we have when we associate. I mean, humans are very associative creatures. We love patterns. We love pattern finding. So there, there's something about it that taps at that innate pattern uh, seeking uh, capacity we've got. But once it becomes kind of manifest and you can move it around, it starts to now be very visual. And that that loop back and forth, I think, is, has been really productive for me. Cool. Great. And I think I know the answer to this, but in case you want to expand on it, um, is the public version uh, redacted in any, in any way or is that the real copy of the brain that you use? And I think that's the real thing. When you add a thought, it syncs, and now the public has access to that thought too. Correct. Correct. It's the it's the whole thing minus anything I marked with that little <clears throat> that little uh, that little lock icon. If I made a thought private, that can only be seen by me. Anyone logged in as me. Otherwise, it's all it's the whole the whole thing. Great. And Eric Wil uh, Willikins asked, um, "How much do you remember, and how much do you forget? Since you know that it's there in your brain, do you allow your organic brain to let it go?" So Eric, thanks for the question. Um, the um, it, it's it's funny. There's a question about uh, when we started using calculators, did we forget how to do like like math or you know slide rules and all that? And I have over over there is my dad's old slide rule, which I need to gift to somebody who cares about slide rules. But there's this notion about do tools weaken our memories or or improve them? And in using my brain at one point some time ago i realized before adding something i need to actually search for it in the brain first because at least a third of the time maybe half the time i already have this thing in my brain and i don't mean a new news article that's clearly new but i mean some concept and um the brain can't tell if i've got an http or https <laughs> that that it'll it'll add both urls happily it's not it, it doesn't figure out that that might have, in fact be the same uh the same site <clears throat> so i go look and that's interesting because um, because I, I, I find often that I've already got the idea. And then sometimes I find duplicates, which I don't like, so I'll get rid of them. I'll, I'll move things around. And then I don't delete thoughts very much at all for a couple of reasons. The major one being that, um, that um, Nassim Taleb tells us in The Black Swan that we never hear from the graveyard, that we study success and ignore the, the lessons from failure. We have survivorship bias which is one of all the, all the different biases we have in, in behavioral economics. And that means that um, if I go to, uh, it used to be that when I was a tech industry analyst, I'd get a call from a journalist and they'd be writing an article about buddy lists. <clears throat> and while on the phone with, with the journalist, I would look up buddy lists and underneath I would see all the different companies that I had ever seen that did something sort of that smelled like buddy lists. And sometimes there's some neighboring, uh, neighboring categories or whatever else. But my unaided recall of buddy lists was, maybe six or 10 companies, this is all of them, <clears throat> right? And that's really useful when you're sitting talking to a journalist about a, a, any story. Um, so I decided when companies go under not to delete them at all because I wanna know who failed while trying to do this. I mean, I, I've seen so many group calendaring startups come and go that when I see a new one, I, I, I share the link for group calendars with them because I'm like, do you wanna know how many ships have cratered on this reef? <laughs> <laughs> one one comment there, Jerry. Um, we did fix the the HTTP HTTPS uh, deduplication issue. Oh, so good. That, that should be working. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering. <laughs> and uh, Harlan, we've talked about a little bit about you know using uh, Jerry's brain as sort of the <clears throat> uh, you know tool for for AI. Do you ever reference Jerry's brain on a topic that you're researching or interested in. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I do the same. I do the same. What does Jerry I think? think? I mean, you, if you know about it, you kind of have to be a little bit foolish to not check. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've gotten a couple emails over the years, just a few from friends who are like, hey, thank you so much for doing this. I've grown into the habit of when I find some new territory, first I go search your brain because chances are it's in your brain and you've already discovered a few things that I wouldn't normally find in a Google search. Um, another addition is it's hard to tell people or to describe to people 
how doing this over time is a benefit, how additive it is. And one of the things that happens is that websites that don't get inbound links don't get Google juice. So when you go to Google, where you outsourced, um, oops. So I have a thought, which is an opinion. We outsourced our memory to Google and Wikipedia, and that's a problem. Mm. Um, Google will not find those old dead sites because they have no inbound links, so they've fallen off the Google priorities list. Um, and it, I still have them in my brain, so what I tell people is go to the Internet Archive, which is Brewster Kahle's magic uh, nonprofit, and enter the old URL if you still have it, which is why I keep them, and then it'll show you the lifetime of that website in a little arc, a little beautiful arc of when they sampled and saved what was on that website, and you can go back in time and see these startups, and in fact, there's a bunch of URLs that got reused. So somebody, the, the, the startup died back in 2002, the name got re, you know, resold, and then there was another startup that had a lifetime, and then there was a third. There's, there's only a few I've seen that have like three lifetimes, and that's a fascinating thing to look at. Yeah, <clears throat> and there is, a, there is a feature in the brain where you can right click on the URL and it'll open it directly in the web archive. So I think that which was- is, uh, Which I don't remember ever is there and I love, that's a great feature. I should put that in the notes for using uh, my brain. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we added that um, after seeing how you were using it. <laughs> and the archive is a miracle thing um, and is under assault right now from Hachette. There's a, there's a big lawsuit against the archive because during the pandemic, they let, loosened up the rules around their digital library lending policies, and they mm. were being whacked really, really hard and very unfairly by the publishing industry. So mm. that, that would be a, a terrible shame if uh, something were to happen to it. Agreed. Yeah. It's basically our memory. It's 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 our our, our shared memory, and that's a, a super important thing. I can't under I can't underemphasize how important memory is, and I could use better ways to explain this, to light this case up in people's heads, because we, I'll just Google it, why take notes? And one of the things, one of the problems that ChatGPT brings to us is, hey, um, all this generative AI means we no longer ever have to take notes, I'll just ask the generative AI. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, not so fast, Bronco. Like, we, we really need to sit and think about this and figure out where human and machine intelligence can collaborate and just giving it up to the machine, I think, is a is a really bad mistake. Yeah, I think, you know, when we did the first press tours um, back in 97, 98, um, you know, one of the, I mean, Google was was coming up at the same time we were, right? And uh, one, of the, one of the questions I would get was like, why do I need this? I could just Google it. <laughs> I'm like, really? Wow, that was happening on your first press tour? Yes. Okay, that's astonishing. Yeah. And and now, um, you know, I'm sure if I went out and, and pitched this, people would say, well, why do I need this? I'll just ask ChatGPT every time I need something, right? Like, um, in, the sp in the small spirit of history, you told me sort of recently that um, it was sort of bad for you guys for me to be the first stop on your first press tour because you thought everybody else was going to react to the brain like I did. Yeah. And I was like, OMG, this thing is awesome. I can totally see how to do it. May I use it? And I'm going to write about it and come on in. And I think the rest of your tour wasn't wasn't quite that smooth. And and there's always this question about unique looking tools and how they fit and all that. But yeah. I'm sorry that I misled you. Uh, you know, back <laughs> December of '97 that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean we got some enthusiasts, but there were there was definitely a fair bit of skepticism. You know, you walk in the door and you say we're going to replace the metaphor for computing. People are like, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, this in the same batch of briefings when, with you guys, there was another company that had an equally ambitious name, like the Brain, except I don't remember what it was. And I took the briefing, and it was absolutely nothing. And they, I don't think they ever actually even made it out with a product. But mm -hmm. it was really interesting because I remember also getting the first solicitation for like the Brain, and I'm like, right, okay. And and you know, you listen, you listen to the pitch, and that's when you start to find out. Yeah. You know, a couple of people have chatted in about, you know, where where the brain initiated. Um, uh, someone said, um, had you ever heard of Max Think? Um, or, you know, what what inspired you to uh, to create nope. the brain, Harlan? Nope. <laughs> Here's Max uh, Think and Larson. I have it under concept mapping. Here are oh, all the concept right. mapping tools. Yeah, he about it. <laughs> I have visual search tools. I have visual analysis tools. I have uh, a whole bunch of different categories. In fact, in fact, 
um, mapping tools for thinking is the thought to go to to see uh, all the different categories, which includes the outliners like Rome and all, all those others. I, I collect them all here. So all of these yellow uh, are, yellows are actually categories. So here's open knowledge networks, here's personal knowledge networks, uh, here's personal knowledge management. All these things are collected under mapping tools for thinking. Cool. Yeah, no, when, uh, when, we, when I first started working on the brain, when I came up with the idea for the brain, um, I, I didn't know very much at all about the space. Um, you know, the space kind of didn't really exist. I, it's sort of fair to say, um, you know, after we came out, um, you know, people would say, oh, it's like Echo Pro or it's like Lotus Agenda. Um, and they had like all these other things that they were using that they, they thought the brain was a great replacement for. But um, I was not familiar with any of those tools. Um, and uh, I guess kind of the first thing that really was shown to me that I thought, hey, you know, they kind of thought about this already, um, was uh, mind maps, um, which I'd never heard of. Um, but uh, yeah, Tony Buzan and the mind, I think right. it's called the mind mapping book or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> but that was uh, that was the first uh, thing that I saw after we built the brain and thought, hey, this is kind of similar. Um, of course, mind maps are uh, two-dimensional and, and all that stuff. We, we won't get into that, but um, so yeah, there was there was no. If I, I think if I had seen mind maps, I might not have built the software. And if I had, it wouldn't have been built this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. And there's there's a lot of like little accidents along the way that yeah. lead to where we are now. It's it's yeah. I yeah. love how these it, things work. Yeah, uh, and then a few years later. Um, Somebody said, hey, have you ever heard of this thing called the Memex? Have you read this article called As We May Think by Vannevar Bush? <laughs> and I was like, holy moly, this guy was like a super genius. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so so, uh, so somebody was thinking about the brain in 1945. He just didn't have the tools to build it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He and and the, it was a desk with microfiche in it, basically that he was proposing. But he had exactly the right ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's there's a bunch of different communities that are fans of some of these different things. That Engelbart has kind of descendants and fans. Uh, Nicholas Luhmann created Subtle Custom, uh, which means slip boxes. And so that has a, a bunch of different communities. Here's a bunch of Subtle Custom fans, and and here's how that works. Um, and and one of my problems with the sector is that these groups are kind of inwardly focused and they're not talking to each other about how to build collective knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's the part, that's the piece of the puzzle that really like lights me up. It's like, if, if all we did was use these tools to create better private little stores of, of, of data, that's good, that's not my jam. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out how do we build shared memory so that we can fix stuff, make stuff better. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the next generation of uh thinking tools yeah yep. and and for me this has civilizational implications if i may slip that in mm. in the sense of we are currently in a mexican standoff around the world around politics we're basically unable to deal with things like climate change because in america we're busy trying to keep america from becoming the handmaid's tale which is such an absurd and dangerous thing that i can't even begin to explain my outrage about it um so before anybody's going to look at my shiny mind map and my belief system, they need to trust me a little bit. So I feel like I'm vulnerable in exposing my beliefs and what I think and what's going on in the tool. But there's still this, I'm not even going to look at your tool if I don't trust you somehow. So for me, there's a whole other piece that we haven't talked about at all that has to do with rebuilding trust, bridging the cultural divide. And I've got, um, I've got a whole bunch of things uh, about bridging the cultural divide, for example. This really, really matters as much as yeah. visualizing and sharing data, because unless we figure out how to talk to each other again, we don't get any place. Yeah, no, um, I mean, that is a uh, that is a problem that uh, literally keeps me up at night sometimes. I'm like, how can we <laughs> how can we survive if we can't talk to each other just because of some small disagreement? It's 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 kind of crazy. You know? But yeah, I mean, um, I think if people could understand each other better, uh, they would be less likely to kind of jump to conclusions about each other. Right? Absolutely. Uh, one of my heroes is Daryl Davis, 
uh, and Daryl uh, is a black jazz pianist who has a garage full of uh, Ku Klux Klan robes because through patience, he basically befriended a bunch of Grand Dragons and others, and they renounced the KKK and handed him their robes. And his simple question is, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Mm. Yeah, and it's, very, like, it's very, a lovely, very relevant to our times. Lovely I mean. question. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Well, a lot of questions are coming up about, um, you know, we've just recently clicked through a lot of thoughts and people are saying, I can't wait to see the recording to take my time and really go through this. As Harlan mentioned, we're going to give you, you know, thought by thought, every thought that, that Jerry visited today. Uh, but also, yes, we are recording. That will be available tomorrow. Um, if you have any further questions for us, you can always contact us, support at thebrain.com. We're happy to um, answer any questions you have. And Jerry, how can people reach out to you? Um, so anybody can, I'm pretty easy to find. Google my name, Jerry Mikulski. Uh, my handle at Twitter, which I still am on and it still hasn't melted yet for me, is at Jerry Mikulski. Uh, my email is associate at gmail, S-O-C-I-A-T-E. Uh, send me email. Uh, if you connect to me on LinkedIn, please say that you listened in on the seminar or something like that, because I don't just say yes to everybody who wants to connect on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, I, I run a bunch of calls every week uh, since the start of uh, lockdown that have to do with these topics. You're welcome to join those calls. Uh, the major one is called Open Global Mind. I just hosted it this morning. Uh, every Thursday morning at uh, 8 a.m. we have uh, that call. So uh, love to know more. Awesome. Great, great. Well, uh, once again, I'm going to share all of the questions that have come in while we've been chatting. I haven't been back on the uh, answering all the most recent questions. So we'll review this. Uh, we'll share this with uh, with Harlan and with Jerry as well. Um, so they'll get back to you with any direct questions that you, uh, you may have had. And with that, Jerry and Harlan, any other uh, topics of conversation or closing statements or, or thoughts to share? Why don't I go first and then you can wrap the call, Harlan. Sure. We've managed to sort of lay our hands on a bunch of really important issues in this call, at least issues that really matter to me a lot, any one of which would be another great flowering of you know several hours of sessions or topics for the calls that I'm hosting or whatever else. And I'm glad we did that. I think that that this isn't just about how do I archive a bunch of books that matter about sustainability and so forth. That's just the that's just barely touching the the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, of what's possible and and what we can do with these kinds of tools together. Um, so uh, it feels like we're at a moment where if we don't give up on human intelligence because now we have generative AI, that tools like the brain are the the bridge, the the way to sort of uh, find our way together to meld what's up here with what's out there uh, in hopefully very productive ways. Um, and along the way, we have to skirt the, the rocks and dangers because there are all sorts of ways this could go south. And uh, unless ethical AI people and others sort of manage to keep their hands on the tiller a bit, and there's no way to, to take away these tools from everybody. The, the letter that came out recently says telling everybody to just cease and desist for six months. I'm like, seriously? You actually can't do that. that that's like cats out of bag, horse out of barn. Uh, can't, can't do that anymore. Can't put toothpaste back in tube. Um, and I'm just realizing I don't have all those metaphors in my brain, so I'm going to add them when we hang up. Harlan, over to you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think everything that Jerry just said is, uh, you know, um, you know, very relevant and uh, important. Uh, you know, the uh, I think I think the whole let's put this back in the box for six months was more of a gesture than an actual plea to try to do that. I mean, I, I hope because <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think that we could do that. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting time to be alive for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, the 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 changes that are happening so rapidly um, are scary at, in some ways, but very exciting. Um, and, you know, we see that in the world but also in kind of a little microcosm of the brain and kind of what's happening here. Um, you know, we have a lot of very interesting things coming um, that are that are built on this technology. Um, and I think it's going to be uh, a very exciting time uh, in the world just generally, but also for the brain. 
Um, so stay tuned. And thank you, thank you very much, Jerry, for uh, for joining us here today. And uh, yeah, <laughs> um, thank you, last... thank you for, for hosting this call. And more than anything, thank you for writing the software and showing up uh, in our offices back 25 plus years ago. So so glad we were able to uh, you know keep your brain going digitally for 25 years. Um, and uh, you know the next 25 will be even more interesting, I'm sure. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining Thanks, us. Everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.